Howdy everyone and welcome back to class. In this video we're going to talk about an engine's cooling system. So the main job of the cooling system in our engine is not just to cool the engine, it's to maintain operating temperature. So that means it's actually going to help warm up the engine as much as it is going to help cool it down. So there's a an area or a range of temperature that our engine wants to be at. And that's gonna vary a little bit from engine to engine, but it's usually gonna be roughly around uh, 200 to 20 degrees, uh, at least for our coolant. And older engines may want to run at a lower temperature while newer fuel injected engines want to generally run at a little bit of a higher temperature. Um, and our cooling systems to help get us up to operating temperature as quickly as possible. And once we reach operating temperature, it's gonna help keep us from exceeding that temperature. So that's the job of our cooling system. And it really does this through a number of components, but mainly our coolant. So our coolant, um, against what a lot of people might believe, is actually a mixture. So coolant is actually a mixture of antifreeze and water. I know a lot of people will use the term coolant antifreeze synonymously. They are not the same. Coolant is partial mixture of antifreeze, but also water. So what is antifreeze? So antifreeze is going to have a number of benefits that water doesn't have. Antifreeze is going to help raise the coolant uh, boiling point above what water is. So water is gonna boil at 212. Well, our operating temperature is more likely going to be higher than that. And so we can't use water because water water's gonna boil and it's going to create a bunch of air pockets. Air pockets aren't great for cooling. So we don't want boiling. So antifreeze is gonna help raise the boiling point. Another thing that antifreeze is gonna do is exactly what its name sounds like, which is antifreeze. It's going to lower your freezing point of the coolant. Water freezes at around 32 degrees. Well, here in Riverside, California, um, sometimes a couple days out of the winter, it may get below 32 degrees. Uh, we rarely get snow, but if your car's been sitting out all night, the last thing you want is your coolant to be frozen, um, which it will actually lead to overheating, believe it or not. If your coolant is frozen in place, it's not going to be able to circulate um, and so the engine can actually start to overheat because you're not getting the cooling that you need. So weird, but um, it's key, it, antifreeze is going to help keep our coolant from freezing uh, as well as boiling. Also, we know what happens when water and metal hang out too long together, right? They tend to rust and so antifreeze is also going to provide a couple of things. It's actually going to prevent a rust or corrosion prevention and it's also going to lubricate a little better than water. So your cooling system should have more than just water in it. It should have coolant, not just antifreeze. Also, if I just use antifreeze, here's the problem. Uh, if you take 100% antifreeze made of whatever it might be, ethylene glycol, propylene glycol, the problem you're going to end up with is an overheating problem. You're like, but wait, isn't that better than water? Here's why we still want about 50% of your coolant to be made up of water. Um, and in fact, actually distilled water if you can help it. Water does one thing really well that antifreeze does not. And that is transferring heat. So picking up heat from one place and releasing it or, um, or, or, or actually, well, if we were to break that down, picking up heat from one place, transferring it from one place to another, and then being able to drop it off and being able to do it in a timely manner because our coolant's gonna be circulating through the system and so we need to pick up heat, drop it off, pick up heat, drop it off, pick up heat, drop it off. And if I can't do that fast enough, we're gonna run into overheating problems. So if you have too much antifreeze, then you're gonna run into overheating. If I have too much water, I'm gonna run into overheating. So our perfect mixture, at least in this part of the country, is going to be about 50% water, 50% antifreeze. So if we're looking at a graph, a uh, percentage of antifreeze and water. Um, if we are at about 50%, we're going to get a freezing point of around negative 35 degrees, which 
in pretty much most of the world, we don't hit lower than negative 35. But maybe if you're in Alaska, that hits a little bit too close to where you're going to be running and maybe in certain parts you, you run into that. So if you live in a very, very cold part of the country, maybe you live in Alaska or Canada or, or Nebraska, wherever it might be, if you live in a very, very, very cold climate, you may increase the percentage of antifreeze to maybe 60 or 70 percent, but really no more than that. You still need some water in there for that heat transfer. So like I said, most parts of the country, 50 percent of each is going to give you a really low freezing point. Um, nowhere near what, what you temperatures you might actually come in contact with. So around negative 35 uh, degrees is around where your freezing point will be with that percentage. The type of coolant you should use is what the vehicle manufacturer recommends. So everybody's got, every company's got their own brand of mixture. Honda uses a blue coolant. Most of them are going to be ethylene glycol or propylene glycol in nature. You should never mix two coolants that are different together. What will happen is you'll get this sort of jelly um, pasty mixture that's not gonna flow at all and it will clog up your cooling system and cause overheating. So never mix colors. So Honda will use a blue coolant. I believe actually BMW has a, a formula that will, uh, some vehicles use blue as well. Um, Toyota makes different colors. Um, they may have a pink coolant uh, while Ford uses different variations of yellow, they've got yellow, they've got gold, they've got a lighter yellow. No, I'm just kidding. But they do use variations of yellow. Chevy likes to use their orange Dex Cool across the board. Volkswagen will use a, a purple coolant. So different manufacturers use different colors because they have different mixtures or different types of coolant. So never mix colors and use what the manufacturer recommends. If you don't plan on buying coolant that is what the vehicle manufacturer recommends, you can use a universal coolant, which is your green coolant. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think any manufacturer actually has a green coolant. Green coolant is universal that you can buy at any auto parts store. With that being said, if you have purple coolant in your system, don't put in green coolant. If you're, you know, somewhere high and dry and you, you, your level is too low, add water and that'll help you in the meantime and then get a coolant flush. If you're going to use green coolant after that, then you're going to need to flush out the system, pour all or drain out all the old coolant, um, fill it full of water, let it fill or, or flush through with water, drain all of that, and then you can put in the new color, which like I said, may be universal green. Um, I don't recommend using a Toyota coolant in a Chevy or, or anything like that though. So don't mix coolants, that's the moral of the story, and make sure you have a 50-50 mixture. If you have too much water or too much antifreeze, you're gonna run into problems, potentially rust problems or potentially overheating problems. So um, it's important to, to use what the vehicle manufacturer recommends and keep an eye on the level of coolant um, if it starts to get low, then you need to fill it back up and you should figure out why it's low. Is it leaking externally? Do you have a blown head gasket? Coolant doesn't get used up like engine oil or, or anything else. So um, if, you're, if your coolant level is dwindling down over time, you should figure out why. Now, how do we get rid of this heat of the engine? As our coolant is flowing through the system, it's flowing through the engine around the cylinders, we call those water jackets inside the block, and it's gonna pick up all this heat. And then it's gonna run down to your radiator, usually in the front of the car. Um, and your radiator looks something like this. And the job of the radiator is to, it's, it's a heat exchanger. So if you can kind of see here, get it to where it's kind of, you can see the whole thing. I've got a, an, uh, an area up here where I've got an inlet where my cooling hose is going to fill the radiator full of coolant. And down here, I've got an outlet. So coolant is going to come through my inlet. We've got tanks on the top and bottom. Sometimes they can be on the sides instead of top and bottom. And we've got these sort of, uh, if I put this a little bit closer here, as we zoom in, you, you can see, see these lines running from top to bottom. They're sort of these rows. 
these solid lines here are your cooling passages that coolant's going to travel through. These extra parts you guys can actually almost see through, those are called cooling fins. So as coolant runs down these passageways, heat is going to transfer from the coolant out to these fins, and these fins are meant to dissipate the heat from your coolant. So, as coolant is traveling from the top tank here and traveling down your radiator, it's getting rid of all that heat through your cooling fins. Here's the thing. You guys can see on this radiator, the fins are all jacked up, right? This can happen for a number of things. Maybe whoever was working on the car wasn't paying attention and they damaged it. I can literally take my fingernail, and if you're looking at this here, and I can, I don't know if you guys can actually see that, but I can actually damage. You guys probably can't see that. <laughs> it's very easy for me to damage cooling fins, right? You can see I just did that with my nail right there. So if somebody's working on the car around the radiator and are not careful, you can damage and bend all these cooling fins. You can see how bad this one is. It's all the way down. Um, no air is traveling through there. So you're not going to dissipate any heat. So if I have any uh, airflow blockage, because air needs to come through the radiator and back out in order to cool that coolant down. Well, if I can't flow air through my radiator, then you can't cool your coolant down. So if a plastic bag gets sucked up and pushed up against the radiator, that can cause overheating. And if you're not paying attention to your temperature gauge, then you're going to blow your head gasket um, and potentially your entire engine by a plastic bag that came up and got sucked up um, in front of the radiator and could have been easily fixed. So pay attention to that temperature gauge of yours. But um, it's, even if you uh, drive through a big old cloud of, of bees or butterflies and they all get stuck up against the radiator, that can cause overheating issues. So be careful of all of that. But that's what your radiator does. I will tell you that most of your radiators are going to be um, older designs had brass. Brass is a really great design. Um, especially when your tanks um, down at the top and bottom or side and side and the fins and everything are brass, but they're expensive. So we stopped making them like that a long time ago. So modern radiators are a, um, a bi-material where we've got aluminum usually in the center for all the cooling passages. And then we've got plastic tanks on top and bottom or uh, this is what we call a downflow radiator, meaning the tanks are on the top and on the bottom, the cooling tanks, and coolant's gonna come in through the top and it's gonna flow through the bottom and come out much cooler out the bottom. Others are what we call cross flow, where I might have a tank on each side, and let me move this back here, and what will happen is I've got coolant that's gonna travel in on one side and it will travel across and down to the other side and coolant will come out much cooler via the bottom uh, on that. So there's a cross flow. This is a down flow design. Um, the most common places to leak on these types of radiators are at the seam where the tanks are meeting the radiator itself because there, there is that seam because they're two different materials. So it's important to pay attention for any crusty white residue on your radiator because that's gonna indicate that you have a leak and you're gonna start losing coolant. So that's just some sort of something to pay attention. Here's a close up of all of your sort of cooling passageways. So coolant is going to enter through your tanks and it's gonna run down these little passageways here and those fins are gonna help dissipate the heat. So that's what our radiators do, they heat exchange. They're gonna take the heated coolant, it's gonna run through this sort of uh, cooling passageways while air's traveling through it, it's gonna get rid of all that heat, and we're gonna take that cool coolant, and we're gonna send it back to the engine to pick up more heat. That's the job of our radiator. Now the radiator cap itself is going to sit on top of the radiator, it looks something like that, and it sort of has a springy little valve on the bottom and it's gonna create a seal. Now, with that being said, um, the job of your radiator cap, well, it has two, it has two jobs, and, and it has two valves inside of it. So one valve is to, uh, we call it a, a pressure valve or a pressure relief valve, and what's gonna happen is your coolant 
is going to be sealed inside of the system, inside of your engine, inside of the radiator, sealed, right? Can't, can't escape. We do this to build up pressure in the cooling system. The reason pressure builds up in the cooling system is because of heat, um, not because of your water pump, by the way. Heat in the system, in an enclosed system, is going to eventually pressurize, right? So if I have a, a tea kettle and I uh, boil tea on the stove, as it heats up and starts to boil, it's going to pressurize, which is going to try to, uh, which is why you get that sort of whistling sound out the tea kettle. That's sort of its pressure relief valve letting you know that there's pressure inside because of the boiling. Well, your radiator is kind of, or your cooling system is doing the same thing. It's heating up because the water or coolant is boiling, or not boiling, but it's heating up. And so it's gonna pressurize the system. Why do we pressurize the cooling system? Why do we allow that pressure to build up? Why not just release it and, and sort of cycle it through? Kind of like a pressure uh, relief valve in, in your oil uh, or your lubrication system, right? That pressure actually helps your cooling system. The pressure is actually going to help increase your boiling point. And in fact, specifically, for every one PSI of pressure built up in the system, you get an increase of three degrees in your boiling point. So let's say you had straight water in there, right? Your boiling point's at uh, 212 degrees. If I increase my pressure by one PSI, my boiling point now raises to 215 degrees. And that keeps incrementally going up and going up the more pressure I build up in the system. Most cooling systems are capped at around 14, 15 PSI. So you're gonna get a significant increase in your boiling point from that pressure. That pressure, um, or what's responsible for actually building the pressure in the system is what seals the system, which is your radiator cap. If I have no radiator cap, the system is going to expand inside and it'll just sort of bubble out coolant out the top of the radiator. So we put a cap on the radiator, seal the system off, so all that heat builds up pressure in the system. But we don't want to overpressurize the system because then we're going to start popping leaks and stuff everywhere. So we do cap it. Let's say our cap's rated at uh, 15 PSI. Um, if we look at this one right here, you can see is rated at 16 PSI. It says in the center, every radiator cap has a pressure rating. Um, this one, you'll notice, uh, has another language as well. So you're like, okay, well, where's the pressure rating? If you guys see the stamp, maybe you can see it. It says 0.9 on the side of the cap here. That 0.9 is actually going to be rated in bar. So we can rate the pressure in PSI, or we can rate the pressure in uh, kilopascals, or we can rate the pressure in bar. Um, a lot of European manufacturers will rate it in kilopascals or KPA, uh, so you'd need to convert it to whatever PSI is. Uh, bar is just another way to measure pressure. One bar is equal to one atmosphere, which is roughly 15 PSI. It's actually 14.7 PSI. So um, if, this is, if this was rated at one, then it would be rated at around 14.7 or 15 PSI, right? Um, if this is 0.9, then it's going to be a little bit less than that. So this one's rated in bar. This one's rated in PSI. Yours might be rated in KPA. They're just different ways to measure pressure. Now, if this is rated at 16 PSI, what that means is at 16 PSI, this is going to sort of spring load up, or you can see this one's going to spring load up, and it's going to allow pressure to relief into our overflow tank. Um, this is kind of sort of an overflow tank. So uh, in the plastic overflow tank, coolant is going to come back into our overflow. And then when everything cools down and sort of shrinks back, the other valve inside of your radiator cap is called a vacuum valve. So this valve down here will actually pull down and allow coolant to get sucked back into your cooling system from the overflow tank. That's your vacuum valve. If the pressure relief valve goes bad, it won't hold pressure in the cooling system. Your coolant will boil much faster. Uh, so let's say you're looking at your temperature gauge and my temperature gauge is fine. I'm not overheating. 
but I'm getting coolant that is spewing out of my overflow tank, coolant's boiling all over the place. Lots of people be like, oh man, I got a blown head gasket. My engine's overheating. That's weird because the temperature gauge doesn't show up. Maybe the sensor's bad. No, it's probably just a bad $10 radiator cap. That radiator cap, like I said, is meant to hold pressure inside the system. So if the cap goes bad, it will lower the boiling point of your coolant and it will just shove coolant consistently back into the overflow tank, which will overflow the overflow tank. So just something to keep in mind so you don't end up spending more money than is needed. Another common thing when the radiator cap goes bad is that vacuum valve where the vent valve is gonna go bad. And what will happen is when your coolant cools down, all your radiator hoses will, um, all your radiator hoses will collapse and suck down. Kind of like um, if you're drinking a milkshake from an In-N-Out milkshake, you know they, they're never drinkable in like the first 10 minutes. You gotta let them sit because um, the, uh, the ice cream too thick, right? So uh, just like your straw, that would sort of suck down because it's, um, the, it's creating a vacuum in the straw, your cooling hoses are going to suck down. Um, so if, you, if you're experiencing that, just buy a radiator cap. So that's the job of your radiator cap. Uh, never replace the radiator cap with a different rating on it. Always replace it with what the factory rating for pressure would be. Um, with that, uh, before I actually move on, not all radiators are going to have a cap. If you're looking at the radiator and you're like, wow, I, am I high? I can't see any cap on here. There's got to be a cap somewhere. Not all radiators have caps. Some radiators are sealed and they travel to a pressurized overflow tank. These are going to have a special cap, which you can kind of call your radiator cap. Uh, and if we were to look at this cap, it has a special valve inside of it, just like this one. These pressurized overflow tanks are called surge tanks. Surge tanks are just pressurized overflow tanks. That's it. Now, instead of your radiator cap being pressurized or holding pressure, it's your surge tank cap that is responsible for holding pressure. So just sort of a side note, another place to look for leaks. The next component is your water pump. Your water pump is not a positive displacement type pump, much like your lubrication system oil pump. It's a different kind of pump. It's what we call a centrifugal pump. A centrifugal pump is going to move water. So every rotation is just simply going to sort of like a crossing guard. It's pushing water in the correct direction, but it's not responsible for actually building up pressure. It's a radiator cap and heat that are responsible for building up pressure in the system. This is just sort of making sure coolant's traveling in the correct direction. If your, your water pump goes bad, um, so it's gonna be outside driven, either off of a serpentine belt or either off of a timing belt. Honda likes to use the timing belts for theirs. There is going to be a bearing inside, right? Because we've got a spinning piece here. We gotta spin this pump. So there's gonna be a bearing inside, but over here where we're spinning coolant, we don't want the coolant to get to where that bearing is. So there's gonna be a seal inside. And when that seal goes bad, you guys can actually probably hear this one. You guys hear that? That's not what a water pump should sound like. What will happen is if that rubber seal goes bad inside, it's gonna allow coolant into that bearing, which is going to cause it to go bad very quickly. Um, and so you can tell when this happens, uh, this pump is gonna have a weep hole down here. And only when the engine is running, this is gonna spin and you'll start to see coolant weep or, or trickle out or pour sometimes out of your water pump. And what that is letting you know is that that bearing, if it isn't already bad, is gonna go bad. And if you hear that sound, then you know the water pump bearing is already trash. Um, another thing is over time, your coolant can build a voltage in it. Uh, when you get into an engine performance one class, I'll teach you guys how to check for voltage in your coolant. It's actually pretty easy. 
But about half a volt is what you're allowed in your coolant. When you start to exceed that, we call that electrolysis or galvanic activity. Depending on the problem, it's either going to be um, bad grounds or you just need to simply change your coolant. We have a lot of electronics and a lot of electrical running around your cooling system and in the engine, especially when the ignition system is running. We've got thousands of volts running through and sometimes it leaks into our coolant. So when we get that galvanic activity, or that electrolysis, you can see it starts to actually eat at the fins of our cooling system. It'll eat up your radiator, it'll eat up, you can see there's chunks missing off of your water pump here. My water pump cannot pump coolant very well if the fins are all eaten up. So it's important to change your coolant around every two years or so. Um, keeping an eye on it, making sure it's not dirty and stuff like that, but it can be perfectly clean and have electrolysis or galvanic activity. So it's important to keep up on your, your coolant flushes. Um, so your water pump, like I said, can be an indicator or can give you an indicator when it is starting to go bad. Uh, water pumps that are driven off of your timing belt, when you get the timing belt, I highly recommend you do the water pump. Um, it's a lot cheaper that way. Just sort of a little tip. This would be a better picture um, on, you probably see it better on your, your canvas, but uh, there's a little wheat pole. Again, you're only going to get leakage out of that when the engine is running. So if you're doing an inspection, what you're looking for on the water pump, if you can see the water pump, is any sort of crusty residue um, that looks like it's been seeping out of that wheat pole. Um, and if you see that, you need to change the water pump before the bearing goes so bad um, it knocks the pulley off. Now, your thermostat is not like the thermostat in your house. So let me explain. Um, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this presentation that if, uh, or that your cooling system has two jobs. Not only is it meant to cool the, cool, or cool the engine, right? It's meant to help warm up the engine as well. Um, how does it do that? So we have a door in our cooling system. And when the engine is cold, that door is closed. This door is to allow flow of coolant to the radiator or to block flow of coolant to the radiator. So when the engine is cold, we want to help it warm up. So we're going to put this warm jacket of coolant around the engine and we're not going to let it move. So we're going to close that door to the radiator. Coolant is going to hang out in the water jackets around the cylinders and we're going to have all kinds of combustion happening, right? So all this heat's being built up and the heat is warming up the coolant. And that coolant staying there, right? That door is closed so it can't go to the radiator to cool down. So with that door closed, the heat from combustion heats up the coolant. And in turn, the coolant helps return that heat to the engine. So it's allowing the engine to warm up itself much faster. Now when we heat that uh, heat up the engine to the temperature that we want it, we open up that door and allow coolant to rush to the radiator to, to, to keep the coolant cool. So we take that heat from the engine and now we're displacing it to the radiator, getting rid of the heat, coming back to the engine and doing that cycle over and over again to maintain this operating temperature. So what do we call that door? What is that door? It's a thermostat. Your thermostat is a mechanical door that is either going to allow coolant to flow to the radiator or to not allow coolant to flow to the radiator. So um, what we're really doing is controlling the minimum operating temperature. Uh, your, your thermostat is going to be rated from the factory. So let's say it's rated at 187 degrees. What that means is our thermostat is going to start to open at 187 degrees and probably fully open at a temperature that is higher than that. So there's usually a wax element inside that is rated at that temperature and as it starts to sort of melt and whatnot uh, and deflect, it's going to, you can see here, we've got a cold thermostat that is just going to simply cycle coolant into the engine. When that thermostat opens up, it's going to allow coolant to flow through and out the radiator hose to the radiator. Do not replace a thermostat um, with a different rating. So the guy at AutoZone tells you, oh, 
I see from the factory it's rated at 187. What you really should do is put 167 thermostat in there so your engine runs cooler. Your engines want to run hot. We want to run our engines as hot as we can without overheating them. That's what they like. They run most efficiently. Um, you get the most power out of them, the most fuel efficient, uh, the, the, the best emissions coming out of the tailpipe when we're at a higher temperature. You want cold air coming into the engine, but you don't want the engine to run cold or the coolant to not run hot. Um, so your thermostat should always be replaced with whatever it's rated from the factory at. Lastly, uh, or not lastly, second to last, there is something that's not in the presentation, but I'd like to show you. Most factory thermostats are going to have a little, I don't know if you guys can see that here, that little jiggly piece here. That, uh, let me see if I can push it from the bottom, that jiggly piece right there. That's actually called a jiggle valve. Yep, that's a technical term, a jiggle valve. Really what it's about though is allowing air pockets to pass through the thermostat so they don't get plugged up past uh, where, or where a thermostat is. So let me see. Uh, show you if, our, if my thermostat's mounted sideways inside the engine. If I get an air pocket that's stuck right here, what will happen is my element will never heat up to the temperature that it's supposed to. So even though my coolant's really hot, it's boiling hot, my thermostat doesn't think it is, and so it's not going to open because I've got an air pocket there. So having that jiggle valve allows for air pockets to pass through. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because most aftermarket thermostats do not come with a jiggle valve. So uh, every aftermarket air filter that, or air filter, every aftermarket thermostat that I get and put on a car, if it doesn't have that jiggle valve, somewhere in this outer ring, not on the ceiling surface, but somewhere in this outer area, I would just take an eighth inch drill bit and I'll just drill a small hole and it does the same thing as a jiggle valve. That's it. We just need something that's going to allow air pockets to pass through our thermostat. And lastly, you don't want to put these suckers in backwards. My coolant is going to be where the springy side is. And as the coolant heats up, it's going to heat up this element and my thermostat's going to open up. Well, if I put my thermostat in backwards, my hot coolant is on this side and not on this side. So this side is never going to heat up enough to open it up and my engine will overheat. So don't put these in backwards. Take a picture, whatever you got to do before you take the old one out, take a picture of it and then replace it with the new one after you've drilled a hole, right, for your jiggle valve. Um, if you're not sure, as long as you know what side the coolant is on, the springy side is usually on the side of the coolant. So that's just sort of a, a good rule of thumb there. Make sure you put it in the correct direction. I've had vehicles that came into the shop were overheating. The customer failed to mention they worked on it before. And so that makes uh, diagnosing the car a little bit hard. And after figuring out, man, must be a stuck thermostat. Then the customer says, oh, well, I just changed the thermostat. I'm like, oh, okay. Go to check it, and it's backwards. So um, it's embarrassing, but if you worked on the car previous to taking it to a technician and you might have caused a problem, you're much better off saying, hey, you know, I kind of worked on some stuff. I don't know if I messed something up. That technician will be able to find that problem much faster, and you'll pay less money. So just FYI. Cooling fans themselves, so many people think that the cooling fan is there to blow cool air on your engine. Eh, not true. The cooling fan's job is to draw or push air through the radiator. Has nothing to do with cool air on the engine at all. It's meant to push air or draw air through the radiator so you can cool those cooling fins in the radiator so the coolant could cool down. So um, there's two different ways that you can spin the cooling fan. One way is via your serpentine belt. Your cooling fan is either gonna be driven off of the serpentine belt um, using some sort of fan shroud. So this is where the pulley off of your engine would spin. And you can see that I can spin this freely and my fan does not spin. We have something in here called a fan clutch. And inside of this fan clutch, there's gonna be a bimetallic strip that as our engine heats up 
at a certain temperature, this strip or switch is going to deflect, which is going to engage our fan clutch. So once my engine reaches a certain temperature or this fan clutch reaches a certain temperature, the clutch inside here is going to turn into a direct drive from my pulley. So right now, this pulley is moving separate from the fan, but when this fan clutch engages, every rotation of this pulley is going to rotate the fan. When the fan clutch goes bad, my fan won't rotate, therefore my coolant doesn't get to cool down and we're going to run into cooling system problems. Um, it can also be electric. So if we're looking at uh, an electric fan, this one has an electric motor off of it and I've got two wires, um, power and ground. There's going to be a relay and a switch that when turned on is going to spin my cooling fan. Um, the these, if they do get switched, will spin the fan in the opposite direction. So if you're doing any electrical work on your fan or around the fan or you're, you're replacing the fan, make sure you don't put it in backwards um, because it will push air in the opposite direction, which will cause overheating. With that being said, if you're working ever around any electric cooling fans, do not put your fingers in here, even with the engine off. A lot of times there are automatic switches where even with the cars off, if it reaches the temperature, it's going to automatically turn these on. Um, and you can cut your fingers off. You can uh, get hair dragged into here, jewelry, all kinds of stuff. So be very careful around electric cooling fans. Cooling fans, their purpose is to draw air through the radiator, not to blow air onto the engine. The fan shroud is the plastic piece that goes around the fan on the radiator. So many people remove this because they're like, oh, this is just extra plastic on the engine. No, no, it's not. This, uh, most electric cooling fans will come with the shroud attached to them. So the shroud is this black piece here. So this is gonna mount onto my radiator. And the purpose of this black fan shroud here is to force any air that my fan is sucking through the radiator to force it through all of this. It's like a funnel. If I have no shroud and it's just the fan behind the radiator, what can actually happen is the fan is going to suck air, but what will happen is air will go around the radiator and to the fan. If that happens, I don't get air through the radiator and I don't get cooling of my coolant. So don't take the fan shroud off. It will cause overheating. I have seen it on multiple occasions. So fan shrouds need to be reinstalled if you're ever removing things. Um, they're not designed as a tool holder. And their job, this plastic, what seems to be useless piece, it actually has a very uh, purposeful use to funnel air to make sure it's through the radiator, not around the radiator. Your coolant hoses, the main hoses that you're going to deal with on a cooling system are going to be the radiator hoses that come from the engine to the radiator, from the radiator to back to the engine. So your, your upper and lower radiator hoses. And then you're going to have a couple of heater hoses in the back that are going to carry coolant from your engine to the heater core to work your heater, right? So when you turn on your heater, notice your heater doesn't work until your coolant is hot. Because your, your heater uses hot coolant to help heat the passenger compartment. Um, with that, if your engine is ever overheating, if you turn on your heater to full blast, your heater core acts as a second radiator and can help you sort of uh, hobble your way back to a gas station or something to um, at least by a little bit of time. But if your engine starts overheating, don't drive it overheating. You might take an engine that maybe it was overheating because you were low on coolant. Well, that's an easy fix. If you keep driving it low on coolant, now you've got a blown head gasket, and now you've got a warp cylinder head, and now it's gonna cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars to fix your car when you could have just added coolant. So don't run your engine while it's overheating. So your cooling hoses simply are there to transport coolant either to the radiator or either to the heater. They do, um, they're wearable components, so these hoses do wear out over time. Um, when, when I say wear out, what can happen to them? Uh, they can 
they, they can wear out inside. So if you're squeezing your cooling hoses, that's part of your, your check, you're gonna squeeze cooling hoses and if you start to feel soft spots inside the cooling hose, this is what a soft spot looks like. So this one has it, but if I, I cut this open so you guys can see, those soft spots are usually cracks inside of the hose. This is a ticking time bomb waiting to happen and the next time you plan on doing a long drive, this radiator hose is probably going to pop. And I don't care how good you are at working on cars, you can't poop out a radiator hose. And I guarantee that closest shop probably knows how badly you need it and they may you're at the mercy of whatever they're gonna charge you for it. So check your hose as often as you can um, because that's part of your maintenance and you're much better off uh, with preventative maintenance than, than having to fix stuff while you're on the side of the road. So. Um, we're, we're going to go ahead and visually check your hoses for any cracks, bubbles. Um, you're going to squeeze the hoses for any soft spots or if they sound crunchy like there uh, is cornflakes inside of them. Another way that hoses can go bad is if there is an external leak of some other fluid on them. So if we look at this hose here, it's all gummed up right here. This is because it had an external oil leak that was dripping on the coolant hose and over a period of time these hoses are uh, rated for one type of fluid and that is coolant and if you get fuel or oil on this hose then you are going to break it down and it's eventually going to fail um, so if you start to see any of that replace the hose and when you go to replace a coolant hose make sure it is a coolant hose that is not rated for anything else but coolant. Same with oil. If I'm changing a line that uses, uh, that, that is transporting oil, it needs to be rated for that fluid. Same with fuel, everything else. Now the hose clamps themselves should be replaced when you replace the hose. Uh, factory clamps are a spring type clamp um, that are, are going to have two tabs that you squeeze with pliers and it unloads the spring. Those spring clamps should be replaced every time you replace the hose um, on a customer vehicle for sure. If it's your own vehicle and you're reusing them, just know that you're sort of taking a gamble. Uh, common aftermarket clamps are going to be the worm gear type clamps where you unscrew the little nut and uh, it, it will loosen or tighten the clamp. Those can be reused to an extent. Uh, you can usually tell when they're starting to get worn out. They do make special pliers that are meant for your spring-loaded clamps as well. They, they can come in a bunch of different designs, but if you're working on a customer's vehicle and you're doing a set of cooling hoses, you should charge clamps along with them. Believe me, 50 cents or a dollar is a really good insurance policy than for them to be stuck on the side of the road because you didn't replace the clamp. The cooling system also, like I said, your water pump can be driven off of a serpentine belt. And in the basic inspection video, I showed you guys how to check your serpentine belts, but we're looking for things like frayed edges, right? If we look at all those cracks, um, you can't tell serpentine belts, it's normal for them to have a, a, sometimes a bunch of little cracks, but these ones are pretty large. Um, my camera doesn't really want to focus and see, but this is a pretty cracked and worn out serpentine belt. So um, we're checking if oil is leaking on these and they're getting oil soaked, it needs to be changed. Uh, if they're fraying, anything like that, um, if they're broken or cracked or glazed where they're all shiny on the backside, it needs to be replaced. If I don't have a serpentine belt that works, let's say it snaps, not only is my serpentine belt not gonna turn my water pump, it's not gonna turn my alternator, it's not gonna turn my power steering pump, you're gonna run out of a lot of other accessories to your air conditioning and such, so um, keep an eye on that serpentine belt and inspect that for wear. And then lastly, your belt tension, if there's not enough tension on here, you're gonna get a lot of belt squeal, that ee, right? That super high pitch, annoying sound. Um, that can happen either because the belt itself is bad and has stretched out, or the tensioner is not set properly. If it's an auto tensioner, that auto tensioner can go bad. Um, there is a number of reasons. Um, if it's a manual tensioner, maybe the manual tensioner needs to be set at a higher tension. They do make temp 
uh, tension gauges that you can use to see if it's at factory or if it needs uh, more tension or your auto tensioner needs to be replaced. Um, if the belt tension is too loose, the belt will do a burnout on your pulleys and it will make that really gnarly squeal that I just talked about. If the tension is too tight, this one's dangerous because it's sort of silent but deadly. Um, if the belt tension is too tight, it won't make a sound initially but it will damage the pulley bearings on all of the accessory pulleys. And the weakest one will go out first and will start to squeal. And eventually if that bearing pulley goes out, the bearing will shear off and you're gonna lose your accessory belt. So keep an eye on that belt tension. Don't let those belt squeals go on for too long um, because it can lead to bigger problems. Again, we want to we want to work preventatively. Preventative maintenance is key rather than letting a problem get worse and worse until it's going to cost you a lot of money. So biggest thing that I'd like you guys to take away from this is keep an eye on your temperature gauge. And now you've got at least a, a decent idea of how your cooling system works. So if you're dealing with an overheating problem, start to pinpoint, okay, do I have enough coolant? Okay. Um, are there coolant uh, leaks anywhere? Do I see any crusty white residue on cooling hoses or my radiator? And you can sort of start to pinpoint things like that. When you get into an engine performance one class, I'll teach you guys how to further diagnose cooling system problems. And for that, uh, if you guys have any questions, please make sure you write them down. Either message me or you can uh, write them down and bring them to the Zoom session this week. So I will see you guys in uh, the Zoom meeting this Thursday.